I'd like to welcome everybody to the CP Intro to Case Writing course. This is the first session. We call it Case Writing Techniques. The main purpose of the first session of the course is twofold. Number one, I'd like to introduce you to the CP, just give you a brief description of what the CP involves and how it's marked. And then we'll spend the remainder of our time this evening discussing some critical techniques that are important when writing CP cases effectively. After tonight, you'll have an opportunity to write four cases. All of these cases will be marked professionally and returned to you with comments along with marking, and these cases will be taken up. But tonight, instead of writing a case, what I was trying to do is teach you some very important techniques that are important for case writing. But before we do that, let's take a brief look at the CP. What exactly is a CP? It's important to understand this, you know, this beast that we call the CP that you're all going to have to be dealing with. The CP, as I'm sure most of you are aware, is a four, three-day exam. Day one is based on Capstone One. Um, I imagine that most of you will be attending Capstone One very shortly, starting next month. And in Capstone One, you'll be working on a big business case as part of a group. Day one of the CP will be based on the same company that you'll be working on as a group during Capstone One. On the CP, they'll be facing a new scenario, something other than the scenario you were dealing with during the Capstone 1 module, but it's based on the Capstone case. The purpose of day one is to, test, is to really test what they call the enabling competencies. We're talking about high-level judgment. Uh, we're not talking about nitty-gritty technical. Day one is not intended to be very technical. It's really testing more your high-level uh, high advisory and business skills. The more technical part of the CP, and for many people, the more challenging part of the CP, are days two and three. Let's take a look at days two and three, because that's really what we're going to be gearing this course to. Day one, I don't provide training for, because my feeling is that CPA Canada does a very good job of that, and you don't need help from past. Day two and three, which are the more technical case writing, which involves more technical case writing, there I think people can use extra help, and that's what this course, as well as our summer comprehensive course, will be geared toward helping you with. Let's start with day two. Day two is your five-hour elective comp. It's a five-hour case, one big case, maybe as many as, may have as many as 20 pages to read, approximately. And the reason why it's called an elective comp is on this comp, there's going to be some, there are going to be some common required, typically in either financial accounting or management accounting. In theory, it could be both, but more likely one or the other. And basically, those common required in financial accounting or management accounting, everybody will have to address. So regardless of the role that you choose, everybody will have to address some required relating to either management accounting or financial accounting. Now, the remainder of the required on this big case that you write on day two will depend upon the role that you've chosen. There are four possible roles that you can choose, the assurance role, taxation, finance, or performance management. So other than the common required in management accounting and or financial reporting, other than the common required, all of the remaining required will relate to your role. So if I choose assurance as my role, uh, and let's say, for example, the common required is financial accounting, I'll be dealing with financial accounting and all the rest of my required will be assurance. The person who chose taxation on that same CP, he'll also deal with the same financial accounting required, if that's the common required, financial account, if that's the common area, but then all of the remaining required will be in taxation. That is why it's called the elective comp. This is the CP's chance to really test in a great deal of depth your, your particular area that you've elected to, so to speak, specialize in. Day three is only four hours long, and instead of writing one big case, typically there would be three cases. It says over here, in theory, there can be three or four, but historically, there have only been three cases. These three cases will add up to exactly 240 minutes. So you could have three cases that are 80 minutes each, or you could have a long case followed by a short case. It basically has to add up to 240 minutes. The shortest the case can be would be 60 minutes, the longest 90 minutes. Now, when it comes to day three, on day three, everybody is writing the exact same cases. So it's no longer a function of your role. You don't choose a role for day three. Everybody writes exactly the same cases. Therefore, on day three, they cannot test any subject at the elective level. 
All of the subjects have to be tested at the core level because, again, everybody is writing the same cases. So it wouldn't be fair, for example, to test, say, assurance at the elective level because then you give the assurance people an advantage. So at the end of the day, every subject is tested at the core level because everybody is writing exactly the same cases. Does anybody have any questions on dates two and three of the CV? You're asking, let's take a look at your question. For day two, do we need to show comp? And other than elective, how much weightage should be given to other than elective? I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I understand your question. Basically, most of the required will be relating to your electives. So for example, you may have a couple of required relating to accounting, and then you may have numerous required relating to your specialty area. So the biggest part of the weighting will be on your specialty area. I don't know if that's what you're asking, but if you are, if let's say you chose taxation as your depth area, most of your requires will relate to taxation. Let's continue. Just want to see if there's a further question. If, if somebody asked, could you have both management and financial accounting as a common required? In theory, I believe that's possible, but in all likelihood, it will be one or the other. So in all likelihood, it will be either financial accounting or management accounting rather than both. Now, what exactly is the CV attempting to test? So one of the most important things for you to understand is that the CV is not a memory dump. They're not looking at you to or they're not going to reward you for regurgitating technical knowledge. That is not the purpose of the CV. What the CV is indeed testing is the candidate's ability to demonstrate competency rather than simply testing knowledge. So if I had to, in one sentence, encapsulate what the CP is all about, it's all about your ability to apply knowledge and not simply recite knowledge. The UP is all about taking the various skills you have, whether it's knowledge from financial reporting, whether it's assurance, whether it's tax, or in some cases, just plain business sense and applying it to case facts. The more case facts to which I apply my technical knowledge, the more depth I'm able to attain and the better I'm gonna do on the exam. So this is not a regurgitation exam. This is basically an exam that is testing on your ability to take the knowledge and apply it to a case scenario. The more facts that I utilize, the better I'm going to do. Now, in terms of the six competencies that you can be tested on the safety. These are the six competencies, and you should be familiar with them. These are exactly the same competencies that came up in the modules for those of you who did PEP, and these are the exact same competencies you would have been, you would have been tested on if you did the challenge exams, and if you did a diploma or a master's program, once again, you would have covered these six competencies. Now, one of the very important sources you should be using to determine the level of depth in which you're going to study a given area is the competency map. There's a CPA competency map, and then there's an even more detailed version called the CPA competency map knowledge supplement. What these documents do is they tell you at what level you need to know each subtopic within a given competency. The one that gives you the most amount of detail is the CPA knowledge supplement, uh, but again, both are quite useful. Now, what do I mean by these different columns here? You'll notice over here that you've got a core column and then you've got elective columns. These are all elective columns. So let me try to explain. The only area that you, where you need to understand the subject matter at the elective level, so the only type of situations where these columns here are gonna be relevant is for the comp. If, for example, I've chosen performance measurement as my depth area, then I need to know performance measurement at the elective level. If I've chosen finance, I need to know finance at the elective level. If I've chosen insurance or tax, I need to know these subjects at the elective level. The remaining subjects, you would only need to know at the core level. You'll notice that very often they expect more knowledge at the elective level than they would require, say, at the core level. So for example, if you look at this point over here, okay, it would, that would be 1.1.4. Right? Notice how at the core level, you only need to know the subject matter at the C level, which is the lowest level at which you need to know something. But you need to know it at a higher level, the B level, if you're going to be choosing assurance as your depth area. So at the end of the day, you must pay very close attention to the elective column for the purpose of preparing for the elective comp. 
but in other areas, you simply need to know the subject matter at the core level. Now, when you look at the competency map, and you just saw it just a moment ago, you notice that for each of the different areas, notice how they always gave you a letter, right? So if you go back to the map, if you look at, for example, evaluate financial reporting needs, you'll notice that at the core, it's A level, right? This is core one, right? You see an A level here. Sometimes you'll see a C level. Sometimes you'll see a B level. What does ABC really mean? So I'd like to just explain to you what this means, and that way you'll have a better understanding when you look at the competency map. The lowest level at which you might need to know something is the C level. Now, C level means I just need a very, very basic knowledge of that particular subject. So if something C level, spend very minimal time on it. It means that you don't need to know the subject matter in a great deal of detail. When something is labeled as B level, it means you need a good working level knowledge of the issue. You've got to be comfortable with dealing with that issue at a fairly detailed level, both qualitatively and if relevant, even quantitatively. And then you've got certain things that are going to be tagged as A level. A level means I need to know all the complexities relating to that particular subject matter. So I need to know all the intricate details. At the end of the day, when I'm reading the competency map and I'm trying to figure out how much time to spend on different areas, and what level of knowledge I need for different areas, I'll be entirely honest with you. I would set my debarkation between C level versus A and B. It is virtually impossible to specifically determine at what level of knowledge I need to know something if it's A level versus B level. Very hard to distinguish between the two, next to impossible. So as long as something is B level or greater, I would have a good knowledge of that subject matter. Because even if it's only level B, they can test it in a fair amount of detail, you need a really good working knowledge. So I wouldn't even try to differentiate between A and B level. However, if something's only C level, that's where I would put very, very minimal time into it. So to me, the key issue will be, is it only C level or is it A or B? If it's A or B, I'll try to know the subject matter well. If it's C level, a basic knowledge should be fine. Now, let's talk for a moment, and this is very important, about marking of the CV. Because at the end of the day, you have to understand how the, how the CV is marked, right? Because if you don't understand how the CV is marked, it's very, very difficult to pass the exam. The CV, in a sense, is like a game. If you don't know the rules of the game, you're not going to excel at that game. So I'd like to spend a few minutes just familiarizing everybody with the way in which the CV is marked. Let's start with a concept of assessment opportunities. For each required, you're going to have at least one assessment opportunity. And they will use these assessment opportunities to determine how well you fared. Now, some instances, one required can have more than one assessment opportunity. For example, say you're asked to deal with financial accounting issues on the upcoming audit. In that situation, if there are three accounting issues, each accounting issue will likely be an assessment opportunity. Now, at the end of the day, it's going to be critical that you hit all of the assessment opportunities. You can't afford to miss any. And therefore, it's critical that you deal with all of the requirements because there'll be at least one assessment opportunity relating to each required and sometimes more. If you leave out a required, that means you will lose a complete assessment opportunity. You want to make sure to never, ever do that because as you'll see in a moment, it's a great deal easier to pass this exam if you've made sure to hit at least all or virtually all of the assessment opportunities. Now, for each assessment opportunity, they're going to evaluate your performance. And the way that they're going to evaluate your performance is as follows. And those of you who went through the modules and did the challenge exams, this should be familiar to you. This may also be familiar to many of you who went through the universities. You're going to fall into one of five categories. The lowest category is not addressed. That means you didn't even attempt to address that assessment opportunity. If you left out a required, for example, you'll miss, a, you'll miss that assessment opportunity. Even if you dealt with a required, but there were a number of sub-issues, and let's assume each issue or each sub-issue had its own assessment opportunity. If you left out a sub-issue, then once again, you're going to get not addressed for that particular assessment opportunity relating to that sub-issue. So not addressed means... I simply didn't address the required or I didn't address the issue. 
Nominal competence means I addressed it, but at a very poor level. At a very low level, uh, basically I did a very, very poor job. I showed no evidence of being competent. Rich and competent means that I showed some evidence of competence, but not sufficient evidence. In other words, I'm not quite where they'd like me to be. I'm not out in left field completely, but I didn't deal with the required or the issue at the level that they were looking for. Then you've got competent. Competent is what you're really trying to achieve. Competent means that you dealt with the required or the issue at the level that they were looking for. You achieved the level that they expect you to be at. And then finally, there's competent with distinction. That would be if you exceeded what they were looking for. You did even better than they were looking for. As you'll see later on, competent with distinction does not affect whether you pass this exam or not. So competent with distinction may help you win a medal, but it's not going to impact whether you pass the exam or not. Now, one final point I'd like to make. The not address category is only used on the CV on day three. Okay, it's only used on day three. For day two, they don't have a not address category. And I think the reason for this is day two tends to be more directed than day three. So it's less common for students to miss a complete required and therefore lose an assessment opportunity. Day three, which is less directed, where the requires are less directed, candidates are more likely occasionally to miss a required and that's why they have the not addressed category. At the end of the day, it's worth mentioning that whether you achieve nominal competence or not addressed makes no difference. Either way, you get no credit. So just keep that in mind. It makes no difference. Either way, you get no credit. This over here is what we call the passing profile. Let's spend a few minutes just making sure that everybody understands how the passing profile works. Because what this describes is what you need to do to pass the CV. And again, I'm focusing specifically on days two and three. Day one is marked separately. I'm focusing specifically on day two and three, which is the focus of this course. It, and I actually, let, let me actually uh, revise that. The focus of this, this course will help you for both day two and three, but the main focus is day three, because in this course, we're only going to be writing multis. Come the comprehensive course in the summer, there we'll be dealing with elective comps and multis, so we'll be dealing more with day two as well as day three. But the basic techniques we're going to learn in this course, although our focus will be on the multi, will certainly help you for both day two and three. They'll help you for both the elective comp and the multi. Okay, let's take a look at the four levels that you need to pass in order to pass the CV. The first level, level one says, was the aggregate competency demonstrated sufficient? What they would do for level one is they would look at your performance on assessment opportunities over the course of day two and three. They'll give you so many points every time you get competent and a lesser number of points every time you get reaching competent. They would then simply add up the points that you got and they'll come up with an aggregate score based on the total points you achieved over the course of both dates two and three. And as long as you meet a threshold of X number of points, you pass level one. It doesn't matter where the points came from. It doesn't matter which competencies they came from. It's irrelevant. It's just a numbers game. Now, some of you may be thinking, so how many points do I need? Unfortunately, there's no magic number. At the end of the day, the number of points that you ultimately will need will depend on the year in which you write. Uh, it'll depend, number one, on how many assessment opportunities there were on that exam. It'll depend on how difficult the exam was. So at the end of the day, there is no magic number. But the idea is to try to get competent as often as you can because you get more points for competent than reaching. And of course, you want to avoid, to the extent possible, getting not addressed and nominal because you get zero points for not addressed and zero points for nominal. I mentioned earlier that competent with distinction does not give you any more points than competent. That's what I meant earlier when I said that whether I get competent with distinction or not does not affect whether I pass. Because at the end of the day, competent with distinction is used to decide gold medal, gold medal is prize winners, but does not affect whether you pass or not. Same number of points, whether I get competent or whether I get competent with distinction. Now, the next level, level two says, were the financial accounting or management accounting competencies demonstrated deep enough? So what they're asking for in level two is the following. In order to pass level two over the course of day two and three, they take a look at how you performed in both financial accounting and management accounting. 
For the purpose of level two, you need to get depth in one or the other, financial accounting or management accounting. Getting depth means getting competent. So for the purpose of level two, getting reaching competent buys you absolutely nothing. All they're interested in is how many times did you get competent in financial accounting? How many times did you get competent in management accounting over the course of days two and three? You only need to get depth, meaning enough competence, in one of these two subjects. The only reason why for many students it's more important to get depth in financial accounting and management accounting is if you want your public accountant's license, then you have to get depth in financial reporting, which means you have to get enough competence in financial accounting. So somebody could potentially get enough competence in management accounting to pass level two, and they may go on to then pass their CPA, but they wouldn't automatically get their public accountant's license because they did not get depth in financial accounting. So whether I get depth in financial accounting or management accounting does not affect whether I pass my CPA. As long as I get depth in one or the other, I get my CPA. But it does affect my getting my public accountant's license. To get your public accountant's license, as it says down here, I've got to choose depth and assurance on my elective comp, and I've got to get depth in financial reporting. Let's take a look now at level three. Level three is where they take a look at how you how well you did on the elective comp in playing your role. What they're basically doing over here is they're taking a look at, did you get competent a sufficient number of times in your specialty area, in your depth area? So say I chose taxation as my depth area, did I, on my elective comp, did I get a sufficient number of competence in taxation, okay? And again, they're only gonna be looking at day two for level three. If I chose assurance as my depth area on the elective comp, did I get competent a sufficient time, number of times in assurance? And the same would be true if I chose performance management or finance. Finally, we have level four. Level four is where they take a look at whether you demonstrated breadth across all competencies. Level four focuses mainly on day three, but there may be a little bit of chance also on day two. For level four, all that they're really looking for is that you're able to achieve at least reaching competence a certain number of times across all competencies. They want to make sure that there's not one competency where you know nothing. They want to make sure, for example, that nobody passes their CPA knowing virtually nothing about tax or knowing virtually nothing about finance. For the purpose of level four, you never need to get competent. You just need to get that minimum threshold reaching competent a certain number of times in each competency. Joe has asked, when do you decide which depth areas do you select for the elective comp? At some point before Capstone 2, you'll be asked to do so. The reason why they're going to ask you before Capstone 2 is when you go to Capstone 2, you'll be writing practice cases. And when it comes to the elective comp, they're going to want to give you elective comps in the area, depth area that you've chosen. Let's take a look at our end question. Will there be negative marking? That's a very good question. Basically, indirectly, there is negative marking because when they decide what level you've achieved, they're going to take a look at the quality of your response. So let's say, for example, I'm dealing with tax, and I say a number of, of, of things that are correct, but I also say a lot of things that are incorrect for that issue. That might shoot me down to reaching rather than competent. So you could argue, I don't know if you want to call that negative marking or not, but if you say a lot of things that are not correct, that could achieve, that could affect the level that you achieve, okay? Oh, Howie, Howie, you were saying that they already asked you your depth area when you enrolled? Okay, Howie was saying that he was already asked when he enrolled. But I can say to you that if, if, if you have not yet indicated your depth area, it would have to happen before Capstone 2. Um, let's take a look here. Um, I'm not sure what you mean, Lolita, when you ask why are there different levels. You have to pass all four levels to get through the CP. So if you don't make any of these levels, if you don't pass any of these levels, you don't get the CP. So if you don't get your CPA. So at the end of the day, you have to pass all four levels. Okay? Let me look. Bucker has, has now, um, has now um, rewritten his question. Do we need to be efficient in financial accounting and management accounting on day two and the elective? The case we get could test both on financial accounting and management accounting. 
it's unlikely, it's quite unlikely that on day two, they will test both. So what they're going to do most likely is test one or the other, financial accounting or management accounting on your elective comp. But over the course of both days two and three, there'll be a lot of both. So for example, let's say your CP financial accounting appears on day two. Tons of management accounting will appear on day three. If there's management accounting on day two, there'll be tons of financial accounting on day three. So over the course of both days, there will be a lot of assessment opportunities in financial accounting and management accounting because they want to give people an equal opportunity to get competent in each of these two areas. I hope that answers your question. Um, I hope that answers your question. Let's take a look here. Let me see if there's anything else. Okay, Lolita says, if you choose assurance as your depth area, do you have to choose financial reporting? Lolita, before you write your CV, you're going to choose one of the four depth areas, assurance, taxation, or performance management or finance. You don't have to choose financial accounting versus management accounting in advance. That is not chosen in advance of the exam. What ends up happening is when you write your exam, you'll try to do as well as you can in both subjects. Many people will end up getting depth in both financial accounting and management accounting under level two, but as long as you get depth in one or the other, you will pass your CPA, but you don't need to make any sort of choice in advance, okay? So at the end of the day, you ask me if you choose assurance as your debt theory, do you have to choose financial reporting? There is no choice when it comes to financial reporting. Everybody writes the same required in financial reporting and management accounting, and as long as you get depth in one, you will get your CPA. However, if you want your public accountant's license, you'll want to make sure to get depth in financial reporting in addition to assurance in order to get your public accountant's license, but no choice is made in advance, okay? Let me just make sure there's anything else here. So Gurmeet is asking, so in the exam, if we're left with little time, should we spend more time on depth or breadth? I think breadth should be given importance in case of shortage of time. Quite honestly, um, Let's deal with that as we go. Let, let, if you don't mind, let's wait till we get further into the case writing techniques to address that. It would be premature for me to address that now because I haven't even gotten into the case writing techniques yet. Okay, so I'd rather defer answering that question. Okay, so uh, Kara uh, Bora asks, so for example, by select assurance, do I need to pick financial accounting or management accounting? As I mentioned in response to someone else's question, you don't make a choice. You don't choose financial accounting or management accounting. Everybody writes the same requires in these two areas, and you try to do as well as you can in both. Okay, I think we're through with the questions. I hope, at least I hope we are, so we can continue on. Um, oh, there is another question from Babic, and then I'm going to have to ask you to hold the questions just because we have a lot of material to get through. Um, for level four, do we need to demonstrate enough depth for all the areas or only for the elective others? You don't need to show depth in the other areas. For areas other than the, your depth area, say I chose assurance as my depth area. For the purpose of level four, they're just making sure that you've got at least reaching competence across the other areas. So at the end of the day, guys, if you sum up the whole passing profile, I need to get a sufficient number of competence in my depth area, be it assurance, finance, tax, or performance management. In, a different, in addition, I need to get enough competence in financial accounting or management accounting. Across the remaining competencies, I just need to get a certain number of reaching competence. So I could pass my exam without ever getting beyond reaching competence in, say, taxation, if that's not my depth area. Or I can never get beyond reaching competence in finance if that's not my depth area. Okay, let's continue, guys. So at the end of the day, what we're going to be covering in this particular course is not going to be the technical. What we're going to be trying to cover in this course is really going to be the case writing techniques. At this stage, hopefully you have the technical knowledge. If you don't have the technical knowledge, we have other courses that teach technical, and we certainly have videos available for that. So again, I don't want to discuss that this evening, but at the end of the day, in the other areas, um, when it comes to pure technical, there that's not the subject of the course we're working on today. The subject of the course that we're working on today and over the next four sessions will be case writing. If you feel uncomfortable at your technical knowledge, again, there are other resources for technical 
that you can avail yourself of from that. Let's continue. I'm not going to spend more than a minute on the CPA way because I think that much of what the CPA way deals with is really motherhood. Again, I hope it's not a, a, a politically incorrect statement to use. It's really just common sense. So I'm just going to take one moment on the CPA way and nothing more than that. Basically, when you're dealing with a CPA way, you want to assess the situation, try to get a snapshot of the big picture. You then want to analyze issues in depth. You want to make sure to always conclude and advise, and we'll talk about that in more detail toward the end of the lecture. Keep in mind your CPA mindset, particularly the rules of professional conduct. And then finally, communication is very important. You need to learn to communicate clearly. Once again, we'll talk about communication in more depth later on in the session. What is the basic foundation for everything you're going to be doing on the CPA? The basic foundation is technical knowledge. You, all of the great case writing skills in the world will not help you if you don't have the basic technical. You need to know the technical before you can apply it. As I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, the CP is all about applying technical knowledge. But you have to have the technical knowledge before you apply. David, are you okay now? You just wrote me a chat. You were having a problem. Are you okay now? Can you hear me, David? Okay, great. Glad to hear that. Okay, let's continue. What I'd like to now spend probably approximately the next hour on is some critical case writing techniques that are important when you write cases. And then hopefully you can keep these techniques in mind when the time comes to write your first case. And of course, the cases thereafter. We're going to first talk about reading and planning the case. We'll talk about assessing the situation and creating an outline. And that involves identifying required, assessing the rule, assessing the nature of the engagement, considering the specific competencies being tested, and ranking. We'll talk about each of these subjects. We'll also talk about writing the case, keeping in mind your professional hat, the importance of analyzing major issues. As I mentioned before, we'll also talk in more detail about coming to a conclusion and recommendation and how to communicate with impact. Let's start with the reading and planning of the case. When it comes to reading a case, it is virtually impossible to read a whole case, whether it's a comp or a multi, it doesn't matter whether it's the elective comp or a multi, it's impossible to read a whole case, memorize all the case facts, and then start writing. You'd have to be an absolute genius to do that. And quite frankly, there aren't that many geniuses in our profession. There aren't that many geniuses in the world. So I'll assume that most of us are not capable of that. Virtually none of us are capable of that. That being the case, if you want to do a good job of keeping track of things, very, very important to keep an outline. A good outline provides an excellent roadmap, and you're then going to follow that roadmap when it comes time to write up your case, which should result in a well-organized response and a happy marker. A happy marker should then translate into a happy student. By having a good outline, it's much less likely that you're going to forget to deal with a particular issue or key fact. If I simply read the case and I try to commit it to memory and then start writing, there is a very good probability that I may completely forget to deal with a particular issue. Or I might remember to deal with that issue, but I might forget to apply a key, key case fact. But as you'll see in a moment, when you do your outline, you keep track of the issues and key facts on your outline. So you're much less likely to forget to deal with an important issue or key fact. Now, in terms of time allocation, you would be doing your outline while you're reading through the case. So on a typical case, you would need somewhere from about a third to a quarter of the total time. Let's say it's an 80 minute case. I would need somewhere from a third to a quarter of 80 minutes to read and plan the case. And that would lead me over the remaining two thirds or three quarters of my time to write the response. If you use up more than about a third of your time reading and planning, reading and doing your outline, it's unlikely that you're going to have enough time to write up the case. Now, initially, this is going to be a big struggle because many people, at least early on, their reading is going to be quite slow. So the problem is, because your reading is going to be quite slow, the problem is that you're going to probably need more than a third of your time to read and plan. Because 
at the beginning, you have to sit there and think about every paragraph you read. So you might find that you're going over time on your reading and planning. That's very normal early on. As time progresses and you get more and more practice with case writing, you'll find that you're able to read more quickly because you'll read a paragraph and immediately know what, what they're getting at, just simply because you've seen other cases. So if at first you're having a hard time reading the case within a third, reading and planning within a third to a quarter of the time, don't let that concern you. That should change over time. The reason I've given you a range of a third to a quarter of the time is it depends on the length of the case. You can have two 80-minute cases, one of which is quite a bit longer than the other. The longer the case, the bigger the proportion of time you need for reading and planning. It also may be a function of your own reading speed. Some people read more quickly than others. Now, I would recommend that you keep an outline on a separate piece of paper. Okay, keep an outline on a separate piece of paper, or you can do it in the, a, the computer. Some people like to keep their outline electronically. I find it easier to do it on a separate piece of paper than to do it electronically, but some people prefer to do it electronically. It's all entirely up to you. You might want to try both initially, you know, on one case, do it electronically, on another, on a separate piece of paper. Also keep notes in the margin of your paper. We're going to show you walkthroughs of cases once you start to write cases, and we'll show you how we would have done our own outline. When I do my own outline, in addition to keeping an outline, I also write little notes in the margin of the paper. So I'm writing notes in the margin of the paper of the actual test paper along with my outline. Underline background information, and I'll talk more about the notes in the margin of the paper in just a few minutes. Underline the background information, okay? Underline background information. As you're reading through the case, they may give you what they call background, and I'll sometimes use the term extraneous, it means the same thing. They'll give you background slash extraneous information. This is detailed information on the nature of the company or the ownership of the company, or it might be about the ownership, but might be about the industry. This detailed background information is sometimes given to you before you even know what the issues or requires are. So I would simply underline it and then come back to it after you've read the case if you haven't used the information by the time you finish reading the case. So say in the first paragraph, they're describing the company and they tell me the company sells 80% of its product in Asia. That's an example of background slash extraneous information. If it's given to me in the first paragraph, at that point, I don't even know the required and the issues yet. So all I would do is underline it. If I don't end up using that information before I finish reading the case, I would come back to it after I read the case. And I say to myself, now that I know all the required, now that I know all the issues, how can I use this information? And at that point, it will likely be evident. Try to keep the level of detail low. An outline for a, for a multi, and that's what we're going to focus on in this course, should never be more than a page. And I'll show you how to keep the level of detail low in just a moment. Now, Manjit, you cannot, he was asking about bringing in a separate piece of paper. They will give you paper. You would not be bringing in your own paper. They, of course, you know, they don't want you bringing in your own paper because they don't know what you're going to put on that paper, right? Okay, so they'll be providing that. Okay, creating an outline, guys. Let's go over the nitty gritty of what should go into an outline. Number one, you should be kept keeping track of the requires. And what I would typically do is I would leave space between each required. So as requires come up, I put them on my outline and leave space between required. In some instances, you may need to anticipate requires if they are in later exhibits. Let me explain what I mean by that. What the CP can occasionally do, and this is not common at all, not very common at all, but what they could potentially do is the following. In exhibit one, give you a whole bunch of accounting issues, but only give you the required when you get to exhibit two. And exhibit two, finally give you the accounting required. Or give you a whole bunch of internal controls in exhibit one, but only give you a required to critique controls in exhibit two. If they were to do that, and again, it's not very likely, but if they were to do that, I would already anticipate the required when I get to, when I get to the first exhibit. If in the first exhibit, they give me a whole bunch of internal control issues, I would assume that an internal control required is forthcoming. And I would already start to track the issues. And there's about a 99% probability that the required will eventually come because it's not the nature of the CP to give you a whole bunch of issues and then not give you a required along with it. Again, 
please don't focus too much on this point because the vast majority of the time they don't do this. The vast majority of the time they don't give you a ton of information before they're giving you the requirement. Just so you understand, the way that a typical CP case is constructed is you've got the main body of the question, which is usually not more than a page, and then a number of appendices, or I use the term exhibits and appendices interchangeably. Some of the requires will be in the main body, others will be in the exhibits or appendices. Again, they mean the same thing. Most of the time, the vast majority of the time, they will not give you information before they're required. But in case they do, I'm suggesting you anticipate. The next thing I would put underneath each required are issues. So let's say the required is discuss the major accounting issues for the upcoming audit. That, let's assume that required is the first required. Let's say I get to Appendix 1, Paragraph 1, and the issue of development costs comes up. Underneath the accounting required, I would insert on my outline development costs. That's my issue. Point number three, salient facts. The key to doing well on this exam, as I mentioned earlier, is your ability to tie your technical into the case facts. So if that's the key to doing well on this exam, if that's the key to doing well on this exam, then it's absolutely, important, absolutely imperative that you do a good job of keeping track of the important facts. So how do I do that? So here is what I'm going to suggest to you. If it's just one little fact, I would write it out on the outline next to the issue to which it relates. So say in Appendix 1, Paragraph 1, the development issue comes up. And in that same paragraph, they tell you they're working on a new technology and they just developed a prototype. I would write down next to the word, next to my issue, right? Let's say the issue is capitalization of development cost. Next to that issue, I would write down prototype. To remind myself that when I talk about whether we can capitalize these development costs, that a fact I can use to demonstrate that technical feasibility exists, which is one of the criteria we need to meet to capitalize, is the fact that there's a working prototype. So if they tell me there's a working prototype, I know I'm going to want to tie back to that to demonstrate technical feasibility, a critical criterion for capitalization. So next to the word capitalization of development cost being the issue, I would write down the case facts. However, in some instances, they may give you a lot of case facts to work with for one issue. If you want to keep a short outline, if you don't want too much detail in your outline, and you don't have time to write a long outline, because you don't want to spend more than a third to a quarter of your time on the outline. So if you want to avoid too lengthy an outline, and you have a lot of case facts relating to a particular issue, the way you avoid getting bogged down in your outline is by not putting every case fact on the outline, but rather making maximum use of cross-referencing. So let me explain what I mean. Let's say I get to Appendix 1, Paragraphs 2 and 3, and the issue that comes up is revenue recognition. But instead of there just being one case fact, there are four or five case facts. Rather than putting all of those case facts on my outline, what I would do is the following. Next to the word revenue recognition, I would simply cross-reference, and I would just write down next to, the, next to the issue, Appendix 1, Paragraphs 2 and 3. In Paragraphs 2 and 3 of Appendix 1, I would underline the key facts, and I might even write little notes in the margin. I mentioned earlier writing notes in the margin of a case paper. So let's say, for example, the first case fact relates to transfer of risks and rewards. I might underline that fact, and I'd write a little note, risks and rewards. If the next case fact relates to collectability, I might underline it and in the margin write down collectability. When it comes time to write out my revenue rec issue, I go to my outline. My outline tells me where to find the case facts. It tells me go to appendix two, paragraphs two, appendix one, paragraphs two and three. And then as soon as I get to those two paragraphs, the key facts are underlined so I can immediately see them. And I've even got little notes in the margin reminding myself of how I want to tie back to the case facts. Reminding myself that the first case fact I want to tie back to risk and reward. This is a great way to make sure that you use the case facts without cluttering your outline with every last case fact. You don't have to have every case fact on your outline. You just want quick access to the case fact. The same is true when it comes to number crunching. You want to keep track of the types of number crunching you're going to do. You also want to keep track of the numbers, but you don't have to have every number on your outline. Very often, we'll make use of 
cross-referencing. So let's say I need to do a break-even analysis. And, and basically, I, I got to Appendix 2, and the first three paragraphs gave me the key numbers that I needed to do the break-even. I might just write down next to break-even, Appendix 2, paragraphs 1 to 3. And then in those paragraphs, I might circle the key numbers or underline them or highlight them. So then when it comes time to do my break-even, I know where to find the numbers. I don't need to have the numbers on my outline. I just need to be able to refer to them quickly when the time comes. So I need them cross-referenced to my outline. Critical success factors, not often applicable. Very rarely do they give you information on critical success factors. These are factors that are critical for the company succeeding. It's the same thing as key success factors. Usually they don't give you information on this, so most of the time it's not going to be an issue. The odd time that they do give you information on critical success factors, make sure to track it on your outline because you'll want to tie back to the critical success factors when you give the company advice. But again, most of the time, not relevant. Some people like to put their role at the top of their outline. On every CP case, you're playing at least one role. I don't typically put it on my outline because once I know my role, I don't forget it. If you want to have a constant reminder, you can certainly put it at the top of your outline. If they give you information on objectives or stakeholder preferences, you may want to put that on your outline, not usually terribly relevant. Constraints. Let me explain what I mean by constraints. In some instances, there may be things that are constraining the company from doing what they ideally would want to do. Constraints simply mean be practical. Let me explain. Let's say, for example, they tell you the company just has a part-time bookkeeper and you're advising them on a management information system. The constraint might be they don't have a lot of staff, so you can't suggest something too complicated. So I might put down part-time bookkeeper only on my outline to remind myself not to suggest something that would be impossible for the company to do. If there's some constraint that would make a particular type of advice impossible to implement, you might want to track on your outline to remind you not to give impractical advice, not to give advice that would be impossible to be implemented. Finally, on my outline, I like to indicate for the issues and required how much time I plan to spend on each. So by four required, above each required, I would indicate how much time I, spend, I plan to spend on that required. We'll talk in a few minutes about how you decide how much time to spend on a particular required. Babic asks, um, can you use a uh, USB keyboard and mouse in the exam. My understanding is that you cannot bring in a keyboard. I've never heard of a student doing that. I don't think there's any issue around a mouse. I think a lot of students do use external mouses, but I've never heard of somebody bringing in a whole keyboard. That's why, again, I don't think so. You can check with CPA Canada, but I don't, but I don't believe so. Okay, let's continue. Let's talk now about identifying the requirements. I mentioned earlier that if the requires are in exhibits, you may have to anticipate them if you receive information relating to the required before the required itself comes up. That can happen occasionally in the event that that happens. We talked earlier about anticipating the required. Some of the requires will be explicit. Others may be implicit. When they give you an explicit required, they say, do A, do B, and do C. These are explicit requires. Make sure you address every required. As I mentioned earlier, if you fail to address a required, you will lose at least one assessment opportunity. You will get not addressed on at least one assessment opportunity. And again, if you go back and you think about the passing profile, you need to get depth in certain areas. You need to get breadth across all areas. You can't afford to be losing any assessment opportunities. So, as soon as you decide not to address the required, you're literally writing off some assessment opportunities. Big, big mistake. Now, some people may have the attitude, let's say there are three required, and one of them is really difficult. People might have the attitude, I may as well only address two out of three. That way, at least I can spend all of my time on the two areas that I'm going to do well at. And people might say, no point addressing the third required because it's so difficult, I'll bomb it anyhow. And if I get nominal, I don't get any credit for it. It's no better than not addressing it. So why not spend all my time on the easier required and just leave out the third one if it's so difficult that I'm likely to get nominal? That is a very, very wrong attitude. The reason why that's a very wrong attitude is keep in mind that if the required is very, very difficult, 
they will simply set the bar for getting reach incompetent and competent much lower than for an easier required. So if it's a really, really hard required, it's a huge mistake to leave it out. Because if you can breathe, you'll probably get reach incompetent. The bar will be that low. And even if you're far off from being correct, you might even get competent if it was so difficult that the vast majority of people were not capable of getting competent. One of the things that I've noticed on the CP is that if you have a required that's really difficult, and therefore almost nobody knows what they're doing, you still aren't going to see only 8% of the people getting competent. There will still be a very substantial number of people getting competent. Why? Because if it's a really difficult required, they will simply set the bar very low for competence. So no matter how hard the required is, please address it. Even if you're far from the truth, so to speak, far from being correct, you may still get competent if no one else knew what they were doing either, because they always want a substantial proportion of people to get competent. Now, in other situations, the required may not be that explicit. In some instances, you may have to figure out what you need to do. Here's an example of an open-ended, more implicit type required. I need input from you regarding all financial matters. They're not being specific about what financial matters. I'd appreciate you drafting a separate report assessing IE's proposal, IE being the name of a company. Here, they're not being that detailed and that explicit. Here, what you would have to do is the following. This type of open-ended required would likely come up in the main body of the question. Remember, I mentioned the first page of the question before the appendices. As you read through the appendices, you'll try to determine what are the financial matters I need to deal with. As you read through the appendices, you'll try to figure out what are the areas that need to be assessed in the IE's proposal. So don't panic if they give you a very open-ended required in the main body. There'll always be further detail in the appendices. Now, big picture required. Particularly on the multi, and particularly when you're playing an advisory role, you could have a big picture issue that you are not asked to deal with explicitly, but it'll have a big impact on the company's success. In that type of situation, you'll want to deal with that big picture issue. It could be a big issue that's going to have a big impact on the company, even though they didn't ask you explicitly to deal with it, you are playing an advisory role, and therefore you should deal with a big picture issue. It's the big picture required that are not asked for explicitly that the greatest percentage of people get not addressed on the assessment opportunity simply because they missed the big picture required because it wasn't asked for explicitly. This is something that you need to build a sensitivity to. You need to build a sensitivity to seeing these big picture required. It doesn't come naturally for most people. It's something you need to pay attention to, and it comes with practice. Initially, people will often miss them, but over time, as I said before, you develop a sensitivity and an alertness to picking up these big picture issues. Assessing the role, guys. In order to deal effectively with the required, you've got to play a role. And on every case, you're going to be playing some role, every case. You might be playing an auditor role, a consultant role, a controller role, an internal auditor role, but you will be playing some kind of role. Now, at the end of the day, make sure that you play the role you were asked to play. Because the evaluation guide that's going to be used to mark you is going to be based on your playing your role. If you don't play your role, you're not going to do very well on the evaluation guide. You're not likely to get competent. Consider potential conflicts. Anytime you're working for more than one party, you may have a conflict of interest if, what's, if you're advising two parties and what's good for one party is not good for another party. Obviously, if there's a, a conflict of interest, you'll always want to point it out. It doesn't matter tremendously how you resolve it, quite honestly. Resolve it any way you like and just move on and then deal with the requires they ask you to deal with. What they're most concerned about is your ability to identify the conflict. You would always resolve it and then deal with the requires they ask you to deal with. What they're most concerned about is, did you see the conflict? And again, this most commonly occurs when I'm working for more than one party and what's good for one party is not good for another. Another type of conflict can occur when you're playing an assurance role and you're asked to do something else that impairs your objectivity. That would be another type of conflict. Consider who you're reporting to, guys. In some instances, you might be writing a memo to a partner in an accounting firm, particularly, for example, if assurance is your depth area on day two, but chances you could be writing to a partner. When you're writing to a partner in an accounting firm, you can assume they know they're technical. 
so you don't need to worry about explaining technical terminology. In other situations, you may be writing to a non-account. You're a controller and you're writing to the president, or you're a consultant and you're writing to a board of directors. In this type of situation, when you're not writing to a CPA, do not assume that the reader of the report knows anything about accounting. Do not assume financial sophistication. Make sure you write it in a way that would be understandable to a non-CPA. Assess the nature of the engagement. There are different types of engagements that can come up. You may be playing a consulting role. You may be doing internal work. Very possible, very likely that in some cases you will be part of the company. You might be controller, internal auditor, et cetera. Some cases will involve audits or reviews. You should be comfortable with both. You may also have to deal with a special engagement. It's unlikely that you would be dealing with a special engagement and assurance in a great deal of detail on a multi, because at the multi level on, on day three, they can only test things at the core level. So the ability to deal in detail with a special engagement is only C level under core. So it's unlikely you'd be doing the detailed planning and procedures for a special engagement on day three, because they cannot test assurance at the elective level on day three, and the ability to deal in detail with a special engagement, you'd only have to be expected to be capable of doing that at the elective level. But on day two, if you're specializing in assurance, it's certainly fair game. They can certainly give you a situation where you need to deal in detail with the special engagement. One point that I just want to emphasize is in the event that they were to give you a review rather than an audit, please be careful not to treat the review like an audit. One mistake that some students make is to treat reviews like audits. If they go to the trouble of giving you a review to work on, the whole purpose is to see whether you have the ability to distinguish between the amount of work required for a review versus an audit. If you end up treating the review as though it was an audit, you're not going to do very well. So just please, please just make sure to keep that in mind and be alert about that. One of the things you're going to have to decide when you write cases is what competencies you need to bring to the table in order to address the required. In some instances, and I would say even in most instances, it'll be fairly obvious, it'll be fairly obvious when you read the required, what competencies you need to bring to the table in many instances. Here's an example. Draft an audit planning memo identifying new accounting and audit issues for the current year's audit. So the bottom line is in this situation, I know I need to bring financial reporting competency to the table because I'm dealing with accounting issues. I know I need to use the assurance competency in this case because I've been asked to deal with audit. So in many instances, it'll be pretty obvious which competency is being tested. However, in some instances, you may have to use a little more, you may have to use a little more judgment. So for example, here's a required. Discuss relevant considerations regarding the acquisition of ABC Inc. Here, they're not telling you specifically what competencies to deal with. So when you have an open-ended required like this in the main body of your question, as you go through the exhibits, as you go through the appendices, I'm using the term appendix and exhibit interchangeably, it'll become apparent what those considerations are. Say, for example, I read the first appendix, and I'm told that they're considering two financing options in connection with the acquisition, and I've got to discuss which one would be optimal. I know right away I'm going to be bringing the finance competency to the table. So as I read through the remainder of the case, it becomes apparent what those considerations are. What exactly do I need to deal with specifically in order to advise on this acquisition? And then it becomes pretty obvious which competencies to bring to the table. Uh, if I care, you had asked me about to give an example review versus audit. No, so an example might be when I do an audit, I've got to count inventory. I may not have to count inventory when I do a review. That would be an example. Let's continue. One thing that is absolutely vital when it comes to writing the CPA successfully is the ability to rank the requires and issues in order to come up with an optimal time allocation. My students have told me that they find that day three in particular is very time constrained because you may have a lot of number crunching to do, 
and you may have a lot of required issues to deal with within a fairly short period of time. You know, you might have an 80 minute case and have like four or five required qualitative as well as quantitative, you're gonna feel very time constrained. So it's going to be very important that you allocate your time in the most efficient manner possible. So in order to come up with your time allocation, you've got to do what I call ranking. Ranking involves asking yourself the following three questions. Number one, how critical is the issue or required to the client? The more critical it is to the client, the more time I need to spend on it. You need to ask yourself, how much information do I have available? This is the most important criterion when it comes to ranking. The more case facts you have to work with, the more time you can spend on a particular required. If you have a required, you have very few case facts to work with, and you're planning to spend a lot of time on that required, you're making a big mistake. It never makes sense to spend a lot of time on a required for which you have very little information to work with. Because remember, guys, the CP is all about applying your knowledge to case facts. If you have very few case facts to work with, that means I should be spending minimal time on that required. If I have lots of case facts, I can spend more time. A final criterion is whether quants are involved. My experience is when you have a purely qualitative required, you may spend a lot of time or a little time depending on the number of facts you've been given. When you have a major quant to do, it will always be very time consuming. Quantitative requires by their very nature are very time consuming. One of the things we'll be talking about generally when we do our take-ups is time allocation. How do I allocate my time to the various requires? This is something that you need to learn and this is something we'll be teaching you because you need to come up with an optimal time allocation. If you spend too little time on something that requires a lot of time, you're not going to get competent. If you spend too much time on something that only requires minimal time, you may get competent on that particular required because you spent a lot of time on it, but you may then get nominal on a whole bunch of additional other requires because you don't have enough time to deal with those requires because you overspend time on a given requirement. So it's very important to allocate your time in an optimal manner. You'll also want to consider the sequence for addressing the major issues, which is a function of how the issues are intertwined. We'll talk about that just a little bit later. Finally, just a few other points to consider. If they give you, for example, excerpts from an agreement, they may purposely throw in some vague terminology. You'll always want to make it clear that we need to define the vague terminology. Doesn't matter whether you're playing an advisory role. Say that I'm, I'm advising my client on whether to loan money to ABC Inc. and they give me excerpts from the loan agreement. If there's any vague terminology, I want to suggest that we clarify that, that the client clarify that terminology before they make the loan. If you're giving assurance in connection with an agreement, and there's terminology that's not clear, you'll want to suggest that the terminology be clarified because you can never give assurance on something that's vague. You'll want to consider the needs of the client when you're playing an advisory role because obviously your advice should meet their needs. As I mentioned earlier, they don't usually give you information on key success factors or critical success factors. They mean the same thing. But if they do give me information on a key success factor, I'll want to tie back to it when I give advice. If they tell me efficiency is really critical, to being profitable in this industry, then when I'm playing an advisory role, I'll want to tie back to how they can be efficient. Again, most of the time they don't give me information on key success factors, but if they do, I certainly don't want to ignore them. Consider constraints. The bottom line, guys, is I mentioned earlier, constraints means simply be practical. You don't want to suggest things that would not be practical for your client to implement. We talked about that earlier with the part-time bookkeeper. You can also have financial constraints. Don't tell your client to do something that will require a $10 million investment when they'd have a hard time getting their hands on a million dollars. Pay very close attention to the exhibits. And again, exhibits are the same thing as appendices. The appendices or exhibits comprise the majority of the case. As I mentioned earlier, the main body may only be, the main body may only be a page or less. The appendices may include new required. Not all of the requires will necessarily be on that first page, the main body of the case. Some requires will be on the first page. Others may be in the appendices. So as you're reading through the appendices, be alert to potential new requires. The appendices may clarify requires for the main body. As I mentioned earlier, 
you may be given a very, very open-ended required in the main body of the question, and then there may be further clarification of that required in the exhibit. You know, discuss the major considerations in connection with the acquisition of ABC. The details of what you really need to do may be in the appendices. Once I know the details of what I need to do, then I'll know what competencies to bring to the table, as I mentioned earlier. Finally, guys, most of the facts that you're going to need to tie back to will be in the appendices, not in the main body of the question. So as you're reading through the appendices and you come across case facts, do not ask yourself, is this case fact relevant? Because the vast majority of case facts are relevant. They don't give you information gratuitously on this exam. If they give you information, it's because they want you to use the information. So the bottom line is, assume that all of the case facts are relevant. What you should be asking yourself as you go through each case fact is the following. Which required or requires plural can I use this information for? Assume that a given case fact can be used for at least one required and sometimes more. If you go in with that attitude, you're much more likely to utilize most of the case facts. If you go on the assumption that the case facts are given to me for a reason, I should be able to use them for at least one required. Now, I'm not going to promise you that you'll always be able to answer this. Sometimes you'll just throw your arms in the air and say, you know what, I don't know why they gave me this case fact, and you'll move on. That's fine. But at least try to ask yourself, which required or required can I use this case fact? As long as you're using most of the case facts, even if there are some where you don't know what to do with them, you still should be fine. Any questions on reading the case before we turn to writing the case? Any questions on reading the case before we turn to writing the case? If there are no questions, let's now talk about writing the case. Nobody expects you to win a Nobel laureate in literature. So nobody expects you to write an eloquent essay on the CPA exam. And quite frankly, there is no way to reward you for writing an eloquent essay. So what is important when it comes to writing? Let's talk about this for a moment. I see that somebody just asked a question. I'll come back to it after we deal with the slide. What's most important when it comes to communicating on the CPA is to be concise and be clear. You cannot afford to be verbose because it's a time-constrained exam, particularly on day three. If I can write the same thought as you in 10 words, whereas you take 30 words, you're going to waste a lot more time than I will dealing with that thought, and you'll have less time to deal with other issues. The more concise I am, the greater number of relevant points I can make on my exam. So if I want to make a sufficient number of good points to get competent, I need to be able to write very concisely. So the ability to write concisely is very important. Some people find that in order to write concisely, it's useful to use point form. Point form is great as long as it's used properly. Some people, when they use point form, they are so terse. They, are, they become almost cryptic to the point where I don't understand what they're saying. What you need to learn to do is, is, if you do use point form, to use point form but be clear at the same time. So, for example, audit risk, or let's say, let's be even more specific, inherent risk is increased due to the following factors, bullet, bullet, bullet. As long as I'm clear, my point form will be great. The advantages of purchasing ABC in car, bullet, bullet, bullet. As long as I'm clear, I'm fine. If you find that when you write in point form, you tend to be too cryptic, then don't use point form. If you're not sure if you're too cryptic, my suggestion, try to use point form. If the marker finds that you're too cryptic and they can't understand you, believe me, they'll let you know. Let's continue. As I mentioned before, consider your audience. If you're writing to a CPA, you can be very technical. If you're writing to a non-CPA, just make sure that it's understandable to a non-CPA. Try not to use slang. Try to write like a professional. Again, that doesn't mean you have to write very eloquently. You can write at a very basic level, but at least it should sound relatively professional. Spelling, grammar, punctuation, nobody's going to mark you on that. 
Nobody's going to take off marks because you're, you, you had some spelling mistakes. However, I would caution you that if your grammar is really bad and there's constant spelling errors to the point that I'm not able to understand your response, that's where it can start to hurt you on the evaluation guide. So if you have you know, a few spelling mistakes, if there's the odd grammatical mistake, it's not going to make a huge mistake, a huge difference. Nobody's going to care. It only becomes an issue when it affects the clarity of your response. Finally, try to be organized. I would have very short intros because there's not much, they don't really give you much credit for that. We'll try to show you examples of sample responses as we go through the course, and you'll see that in some instances we have no intros at all, and others very short intros. Very important, obviously, to conclude, as we'll talk about a little bit later. In some instances, you may be asked to write a memo versus a letter. A memo simply means you say from CPA to so-and-so, and you put a subject. If you're asked to write a letter, you would just go dear so-and-so. Before we go further, Joe has a question. Joe says, regarding case facts, what are the chances for red herrings? Very little of that, Joe. It, they don't try to give you red herrings on this exam. It's not the nature of the exam. They're not given, when I said to you before, they're not giving you gratuitous information. What I meant was they're not going to give you all these red herrings. The vast, vast majority of information they give you is relevant. So do not worry about red herrings. So we have another question. Um, would you be asked, for example, I'm just going to read this. Uh, let me just read it for myself and then I'll paraphrase it because it's a long question. No, you were asking me, uh, he, um, I'm being asked, uh, could you get a question, a company was using straight line method of depreciation, not change the policy, now, or now change the policy to double declining, and you need to recalculate. No, they, that would be fair game. One of the things they do in financial accounting, much more in the CP than they used to do on the UP, is very, very frequently, you will find that you will need to do number crunching. So that would be fair game. Again, I'm not saying it's the most likely type of number crunching, but it certainly is fair game. What I want to talk about now are some basic writing tips when it comes to writing up your case. Number one, I'm going to give you some do's, and then I'm going to give you some don'ts. Let's start with the do's. I mentioned before that when it comes to writing up your case, you need to consider the sequence. The sequence in which you address the required is impacted by how the required are intertwined. It's not uncommon for the required to be intertwined. So before I even begin to type out my answer, I would always ask myself, I would always ask myself, how are the required intertwined? So very, very critical that you think about how the required are intertwined before you start writing. Because if required A impacts B, I better do A before B. If B impacts A, I better do B before A. So one of the things we're going to often do when we do take-ups is we'll ask ourselves, are the requires intertwined? And if yes, how? Once we understand how the requires are intertwined, we can then come up with a logical sequence for addressing the required. Include your full thought process. I cannot emphasize that enough. I once asked one of my most experienced markers, what do you think most impacts the difference between being competent versus reaching? And the answer I got was that the competent count candidate always provides his reasoning. He always gives the implication, the why. The implication is why does this matter? The reaching competent candidate may make a lot of statements are, that are correct, but he's fairly arbitrary. The reaching competent candidate doesn't explain the why. This is something you must get in the habit of doing in order to be competent. Feel free to question management's assumption. There are going to be times when you're doing number crunching where management may give you an assumption that you don't think is reasonable. Unless you can say unequivocally that it's wrong, unless it directly contradicts case facts, I would not just pull a new assumption out of the air. I would use the client assumption and simply question it qualitatively. The only time I would abandon a client's assumption in favor of my own when it comes to number crunching is if the assumption directly contradicts case facts. Then I would use case facts to come up with a better assumption. But that will very rarely be the case. Most of the time, if you don't like an assumption, you think it's too aggressive or unreasonable or not aggressive enough, 
usually it's subjective judgment on your part. You can't say unequivocally it's wrong, in which case you question it qualitatively, but still work with it. Here are some don'ts. Don't contradict or repeat yourself. If you contradict yourself, you demonstrate to the market that you don't know what you're talking about, which is never a good thing. Don't repeat yourself because you can't afford to waste time in this exam. If you repeat yourself and you say the same thing two or three times, that precludes making other points, which could be getting you credit, right? I, for example, if I spend too much time on one issue because I keep repeating myself, I won't have enough time to deal with another issue. So repeating yourself is a waste of time. Time is a precious commodity on the exam. Don't ever avoid the number crunching. You can have a number of assessment opportunities that revolve around the numbers, particularly when it comes to management accounting and finance. Don't use templates. Templates is when somebody comes into the exam and in their mind, they have this idea that when a particular required issue comes up, I always throw down the same point. Very bad idea. Because depending on the particular facts of that case, different points may be relevant. So if you come in with a rigid template, I always throw down these points, and this issue comes up, that would be a big mistake. Try to avoid saying too many things that are technically incorrect. Somebody asked me earlier about negative marking. And what I answered was, even though officially there's no negative marking, indirectly there is. Because at the end of the day, if I'm asked to deal with a particular issue, and I say a lot of things that are correct, but I also say a lot of things that are incorrect. Because I said a lot of things that were incorrect, I may not get competent. So you do have to be careful. I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about conclusions and recommendations. We mentioned earlier when we dealt with the CPA way that concluding and recommend, or recommending is very important. I'd like to deal with that in a little more detail in the context of the CP. Remember to conclude and wherever possible, make a constructive recommendation. Very rarely will a good recommendation be just give up. If your client wants to do something and it doesn't look like it's going to work, tell them how to make it work. Don't ever just give up. Tell them how to make it work if you can. Try to be constructive wherever possible. Avoid jumping to conclusions. Make sure you've read the whole case and you've considered all the facts before you come to a conclusion. And again, this is a psychological thing. Sometimes what people will do is as they're reading, before they've even read everything, they've already decided the conclusion. It's a psychological problem you must avoid. There are three levels at which you can potentially conclude on the CP. The level one and level two conclusions are always relevant. The level three conclusions or recommendations will only be relevant on the odd case. Level one conclusion is you're dealing with a specific issue. Should I capitalize development cost or expense them? I need to come to a conclusion one way or the other. There may not be a right or wrong answer, but if you come to no conclusion at all, you definitely will not be competent. Even if there's no right or wrong answer, you must come to a conclusion. Anytime I do a numerical exhibit, I would have a conclusion. My conclusion would explain what does this exhibit tell me. In plain English, what does the exhibit tell me? Those are level one conclusions, always relevant. Level two conclusion is on the overall required. In order to deal with the required, I may need to do qualitative analysis, and I may, may need to do a numerical exhibit. After considering both, I may need to come to a conclusion on the overall required. Or I may need to do two numerical exhibits, and on the basis of both, I now come to a conclusion on the required. The level three conclusion, as I mentioned earlier, is not relevant in most cases, but could potentially be relevant in a given case. The overall conclusion is where I need to come to an overall recommendation for the whole case, taking into account the outcome of the various required and both my quantitative and qualitative analysis. When would a level three conclusion be relevant? A level three conclusion would be relevant when you have a number of required, but they're all leading up to a major decision that needs to be made. In that type of situation, I would deal with the various required, and then based on the outcome of those various required, I would then come to a decision. I may, for example, have to decide whether Joe should purchase an, another company. I may have to deal with a number of required, and then on the basis of the conclusion on these various required, I now come to an overall decision for the case. Should he go ahead with that company? 
only a minority of cases involve one big decision that needs to be made. It's in those cases where you would need to come to an overall recommendation. Let's just end the lecture. I mentioned that tonight will be shorter than the other sessions. Let's just end the lecture with integration and big picture. When I talk about integration, what am I talking about? I'm talking about integrating between your enabling skills. These are your soft case writing skills, your technical, and by situations, I mean case facts. So I'm taking my technical foundation and then using my good case writing skills, I'm tying my technical knowledge into the situations, into the case facts. That's how I do well in this exam. Don't forget about the big picture requires. I mentioned earlier, it doesn't come naturally to most people. The big picture requires means there's some big issue that's impacting this company. I'm playing some kind of advisory role. I'm not explicitly asked to deal with this issue, but it's scaring me in the face and I therefore need to deal with it. As I get more and more practice, it really will scare me in the face. Initially, I may not notice the big picture issues. It's something you build a sensitivity to as you write more and more cases. It involves stepping away from the details. And once you step away from the big detail, and once you step away from the details, then you're in a position to see the forest from the trees and see the big picture. Sometimes people can become so immersed in the details that they miss the big picture. This concludes our lecture on case writing techniques. I hope that the lecture we just went through just now will help you when it comes time to write your first case, which you'll be doing very shortly. Try to keep in mind some of the points that we discussed this evening. Before we end tonight's session, and again, uh, we're gonna end, please, under, please do not expect to end at this time on future sessions, they will go later. So if you're planning your schedule, keep that in mind. But before we end this session, are there any questions? Um, earlier on, I had asked people to hold questions just because we were getting so many questions, I was worried we wouldn't get through the session. Uh, that, of course, was not an issue at the end. So please, if there are any questions you are holding back, please feel free to ask them. I'd, I'd be delighted to answer any questions people have. Okay. If nobody has any questions, what we're going to do is we're going to end the session now. But again, if any questions still come up, please feel free to email Ira or myself and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. If you did ask any questions tonight that, and you didn't feel that any of my, if you, and you did not find that my answer was adequate, say I misunderstood your question and it wasn't adequate, please feel free to email me and I'll do my best to answer your question. If, are you sure you have no further questions? So if there are no further questions, uh, we'll end the session now and I wish you all a good night. <laughs>